Okay, folks are rolling in from the previous program. Some might have just joined, some um, might have registered earlier. Um, but thanks for being here, everybody. If you just joined the last program, um, applaud you for joining the marathon. Um, and I'm excited for our second half session. Um, Looks like folks are still rolling in. Um, okay, so just a few housekeeping notes is that um, at the bottom of your screen, there is um, live captioning um, and you can click um, the CC transcript button um, and you will be able to um, caption there. Um, someone is calling me, but we'll just ignore that. <laughs> um, I'm also going to put the captioning in the chat too, so you can, um, so you'll be able to see the instructions in um, the chat. Let me find it. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everybody. My name is Adam Desjardins. I'm a programs manager at Culture Source. Um, Culture Source, for those of you who might not know, is a regional art service organization located in Southeast Michigan. Um, we work to serve over 170 arts and cultural organizations and the arts and cultural sector, sector at large. Um, we do this through three um, kind of pillars of our work. One is programs, which we are doing right now online. Normally these are in person, convenings to connect people to ideas and other folks in the arts and cultural sector. Um, we also do this work through regranting opportunities and funding initiatives. Um, so you can, um, so basically you can apply for our most recent funding opportunities, what I was gonna say, but our more generally our funding opportunities work to support um, the arts and cultural sector at large um, and just better, you know, get, um, funding and support to artists and arts organizations. Um, the last way we do our work is through research to better understand how we can better support through our programs and our funding opportunities, the arts and cultural sector. Um, this whole um, program is a part of our digital access for the arts program, um, which we are really excited to launch. Um, it is um, a seven part online program. It's a funding initiative, it's research, and it's also tech expert in, in residence too. So you can learn more about the program, which I will drop the link in the chat as well. Um, today, we're here for a hack session on lighting and audio with Detroit Public Television Director of Engineering, Brian Dunn. Um, everything is TV these days, essentially. So we're really grateful to have um, Brian here with us to share some of the TV magic um, that you know makes lighting and audio and what we can do better to understand how to do lighting and audio from home or online or for meetings or for performances and productions. Um, all of this program is in partnership with Rocket Community Fund. We're really grateful um, for their support of the Digital Access to the Arts program. Um, they're great partners, thought partners, and helped us you know, dream up this whole program. Um, so really a huge shout out to their community sponsorship team. Um, upcoming programs, next week we're doing some office hours, very informal drop-in with Culture Source staff. That's on Thursday. Um, so bring your questions that you might have about federal support, PPP loans, or just really anything um, that you'd like to know more about, and we'd be happy to, you know, um, chat them through with you and, and also, you know, hopefully find an answer to your question. Um, then in later in February, we'll be doing our third round of programs um, from the Digital Access to the Arts program, and this one will be all about digital ar archiving, preserving work, and saving coin, because um, there's a lot of really cost-effective ways to um, do archiving and digital preservation. Um, so join us for that. It'll actually be really good. I'm looking forward to nerding out on it. Um, and then save the date for our spring biennial member meeting. We have some really exciting speakers lined up and we'll be announcing them soon. Um, so join, uh, make sure to save us, save the date for um, March 24th um, for that program. Um, huge thank you to our partners who support us in supporting the arts and cultural sector. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Brian Dunn, who's the Director of Engineering at Detroit Public Television, and will be leading this hack session all on lighting and audio. So, Brian, thanks for being here and um, for your tips and tricks on lighting and audio from a television perspective. Thanks for having me. Um, everyone can hear me okay, hopefully. Um, not at home. I'm actually, I have a two o'clock dentist appointment and I'm at my wife's dental office. So they were, <laughs> they're not my uh, med, med degrees behind me. But uh, that all aside, I'm happy to be here and I have a little presentation to just kind of go through some basics for lighting and audio. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. 
All right, if everything is right, you should only see my main screen and not my notes. Um, as Adam said, my name is Brian Dunn. I'm with Detroit Public TV. I've been there about 10 years, uh, actually 11 going on 12 years now. And I've done everything from manning a camera to running audio to now overseeing the engineering department with my boss, uh, John Mark. Um, so today we're gonna go a little bit into lighting and audio, uh, kind of in like a two part session with another presentation in time to come. And with that, let me just open up the chat real quick. Let's go ahead and get started. So first up, um, I wanted to just briefly talk about um, working at home, right? So we're in a different day and age now where we are not in a studio or we might not be in an environment where we have professional equipment. So just a couple quick tips and tricks that we put together at the beginning of this COVID environment to kind of go over some tips to help you at home, depending on your user level from um, being the first time using a video camera to having experience with handheld cameras um, on productions. So the biggest thing that you'll see is a lot of video that's being held um, improperly is what we always like to say, but going from a portrait mode to a landscape mode makes a huge difference. So instead of seeing a YouTube video where you have black bars on the side of the person, uh, if you use your phone or your camera or your laptop, make sure that it's kind of tilted down the right way to give you the full view that you'll see on a uh, TV or a computer screen. Another big thing that we always like to suggest is to prop up a device. So if you have a tripod, um, that's great. If not, you know, even just your little thumb holders um, or a, a case with a stand or setting your phone or camera or laptop on a sturdy surface. Um, unless you're going for a look where you're really going for that walk and follow me kind of um, production, you want to have as steady of a shot as you can. Both of these things you can get at numerous websites, probably for about 30 to $40 total for a tripod and a phone mount, um, which I'm happy to connect with anybody who has questions afterwards and share that type of information as well. Um, proper framing is huge. So even if you're looking at me um, now on this Zoom, you know, I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings where there's a lot of headroom up top or their head's cut off or there's too much left, too much right. Um, so establishing that proper framing to really um, put the focus of a viewer on the subject matter. So making sure you're not too close or too far away. And of course, find a nice background. So I'm in this little office now and I have windows behind me on one side, I have a door on the other. So positioning yourself in a chair or your talent or your, um, your subject matter in a, you know, something that looks gonna look good to the viewers at home. Um, this is gonna tie into our lighting talk coming up here in a second, but if you're outside, always make sure the sun is behind your um, capture source. That way you're not getting a lot of external light that's gonna be um, blaring out the subject matter. So if the sun's behind you, it'll light the face. If the sun's pointing towards the camera, you're gonna look really dark and everything else is gonna look really light. Um, lastly, you know, find a quiet space, turn off any background noise. If you have air conditioners that you have the ability to turn off, that's usually a big hum that can get a little bit of annoying to those at home. Uh, make sure to enunciate, project your voice, and you know, speak to your audience, have a conversation. Don't feel like you have to read off of a script, but really engage them in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, even if they're not there with you. Um, and the biggest thing that happens that we see a lot of is make sure you count before you start. So a lot of people push record and they go, and sometimes those first couple seconds get cut off. So push the record button, wait a few moments, and then begin your, um, begin your recording. Lighting is a huge part of production, right? Um, no camera can replicate what the human eye perceives. And we light our subjects to help the camera get as close to what we see in real life. So when it's done correctly, you can do a lot of interesting and cool things, but the big top three are you can convey a message um, through the emotion and mood that you present, you can create depth, and you can help tell a story. In doing so, there are different color temperatures that you might notice just going to Home Depot to get light bulbs for your house. So you can choose a light bulb that is in the blue range, usually they say like 6,000 or daylight, um, that's going to give you that more blue. 4,000 kind of gives you a more of a white. And then your typical tungsten bulb is more around 3,200 degrees. So what that really means, um, and it, it'll be make more sense here in a few when I give you some examples, but um, light your subject matter accordingly, depending where they're at. So if I were outside, I wouldn't want to use a 
yellowish light because it would just kind of make my skin, my skin look as if it was the wrong color. Um, that being said, 3200 is your typical indoor lighting and 56 is your typical outdoor. Um, you'll see the degrees K. Kelvin is just a way of measuring light. Um, we can dive deeper into that for those who want it, but I'm trying to keep this as not basic, but um, general understanding for those who are not familiar with it at home. Um, when filming a subject, the lighting can make all the difference. Three-point lighting is your basic 101 that um, every technician, every engineer, um, every even just person at home who's doing records should really try to follow out. Um, it's done in order to manipulate shadows, create contrast, and again, boost the overall quality. So right now I just have a light and you can kind of see based off of how it is hitting my forehead that it's kind of just up at the top of the ceiling shining down on me, where when done correctly, it would um, be a lot more of a professional look. So the three terms that we use with three-point lighting is a key light, which is your primary light source, a fill light, which is that secondary light. Um, it's much softer, not as hard, and a backlight, which is usually placed behind the talent to help them separate from the background. Um, this also, depending on how much room you have, helps create that really deep sense of depth. Um, a good example of that here is kind of in this picture. So if you were looking at um, yourself, um, you can push a lamp on the left and right, or if you're using professional grade lighting, you could definitely use those key light features, the fill light and the backlight to give yourself um, a proper look. This really gives you a better understanding of what that means. So the, the first picture here is the gentleman who is lit with just a key light. So it's very harsh coming in on the left side of his face um, and nothing there that really conveys proper lighting. The next step then comes to key and back. So if we or to look back on this image, that top left light, which is kind of aimed towards the back to help separate him from the background. Um, you can see it's kind of clearing and cutting out from where his ear separates to the grayish background. And then the key back and fill will be a combination of all three of those lights to create an overall well-lit image. Um, that being said, there's nothing wrong with any of these on their own. It's just, if you're looking for that overall clean look, a typical three-point light is the way to go. Um, a lot of that without using uh, a whole bunch of lights is all about conveying mood and emotion. So how, how you light a subject matter can help tell your overall message. So this is done through the type of light you use, where you place it, and again, how you're going to act and present this material um, once it is recorded. So, you know, having a look at these of sadness, only having a key light, not having really a backlight and a fill to kind of that evil or that villain style approach where it's an up light that's in front and below the talent to kind of give them that horrific harsh lighting to really make them stand out from the background or a happy lighting. So really bright lights, a lot of extra light to really show the mood of the emotion that you're trying to get across. Um, natural light and the sun, which we talked about earlier, can be used as a source of this lighting. And for sometimes it is great options, other times it can be overpowering, but with a few helpful tools, you can use it to your advantage. Uh, so the use of reflectors and bounce cards are a great resource that every, I say lighting engineer should have, uh, but really any individual who is gonna be doing this type of work, you can pick them up from numerous websites, do a lot of work with the B&H video. You can get a kit like this, um, which comes with five reflectors for I think roughly around $30. So explaining these, a little bit, um, you'll see there's different shades and they all do different things. And you might remember them from when you went and got your senior pictures taken in high school, right? There's different ways that they um, reflect light to help them with limited sources. So a transparent diffusion, which cuts a lot of the light away, or silver, which can be highly reflective. Gold reflective, but also adds some color. Um, white being semi-reflective, and of course, black absorbs light. So if you have too much light coming in, you can throw in a black reflector to help absorb some of that from your subject matter. A good example of that being is, again, the sun is behind your camera. You could have a large white reflector or even a large white piece of cardboard. It doesn't have to be a professional piece of equipment. Um, and then your subject matter, as well as a reflector that you could use for the gold, the gold rim light um, effect on the back. So using this in a sense that uh, there's no lights, you are outside and with you know two pieces of material, you can mimic a three-point lighting setup to give them a hard key, a fill, and that backlight. Uh, I'm trying to fly through these because I do want to leave a lot of time for questions, but 
if at any point anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them up and I can try to answer them as they come in. But moving on to audio, um, sound and audio, you know, they play together with that visual element to really help tell that story. So good audio increases the production value. It also evokes emotion. Um, it emphasizes what's on the screen and it can also indicate the mood. So if you remember seeing back in the day or even relative to today, you know, old Charlie Chaplin films where there, there wasn't a lot of vocal pronunciation, but the audio that was there in the sense of background music and sound effects really helped tell a story without any script. Um, and they always say, you know, a good, a good story can be told without, without words. So I can go really technical into this. So I'm going to try to keep it um, <laughs> not so much. Uh, audio is one of my passions. So um, again, separate questions offline, feel free to reach out. But a microphone works simply enough by taking a form of energy and converting it to another. So when you talk, it goes into the microphone. Um, usually there's a magnetic structure in there that vibrates and creates the energy that comes out. Um, and then also in that sense, it, it's for what's going into the recording. So the recording of um, Zoom or the recording um, of professional grade audio or music or theatrical, any, anywhere that you're going to be recording audio, that's going to be your final output. So that being said, there are two main types of microphones, which are your dynamic mics and your condenser microphones. What does that mean? Well, the dynamic microphone is a very sturdy microphone. Um, they don't require power to operate. They have a wide range of use from music to um, surveillance. Uh, they can withstand really loud noises uh, or loud levels of audio and they're extremely cost friendly. Whereas a condenser microphone, um, you know, a dynamic can be tossed around and they're virtually indestructible. Condenser mics have more, let's say electronics in them that help improve the quality and um, help improve the overall audio product that you're going to deliver on. So they're much more sensitive. They do require power. And what that means is um, phantom power from a mixer or by battery. Um, they also have a wide range of use, but they can be made very compact. Uh, they are a higher cost, but usually they are much better sound. That's not saying that dynamic microphones don't have a great sound. They do. They've been around for years. It's just choosing the right microphone for each environment that you're going to use it for. Um, some examples are, so if you've been in a television business or even watch TV, um, you can see that there's many different types of handhelds, which are your dynamic mics, which are also used on music. So the SM57 and the 58, um, they're used for vocals, percussion, guitars. Um, the RE20 is a great studio microphone. It's still used today in a lot of radio stations. It's got a built-in windscreen, which we'll talk about shortly, and it rejects a great deal of outside and unwanted noise. Um, whereas the MD42 is similar to the Shure, it has a five position filter. So depending on what you want to use it for, there's different selectable regions to help eliminate that outside noise. Condenser microphones, um, you'll see they're, they're a little different in how they look and how they can present themselves. But um, there's a large diaphragm and a small diaphragm in condenser microphones. Um, and those options are available because of how they're constructed. So the Audio-Technica AT2035 is your best bang for your buck, inexpensive recording microphone. It has built-in filtering, um, built-in pads, usually for about $150, you get that high quality, but low cost for a studio setup. Um, the Sony, that is a microphone that has been around for ages. The, the letters of the part number have changed here and then, but it is a all around wired lavalier microphone. And this is what you see on most of your guests and talent when you are doing interviews, when you are doing um, remotes where you don't want to have big microphones in front of their faces. And it is a microphone that can be used to definitely hide and be concealed. So you can put it on the inside of jackets. You can put it behind ties. Um, there's a bunch of tips and tricks for securing it in a manner that will give you good audio, but it's not visible to those at home. The Rode is a, a Rode, depending who you're talking to, is a shotgun microphone. These are usually used for um, being placed on a boom pole up above the talent. So they'll capture the sound and they're very directional. So where they're pointed at, think of it uh, almost like a laser pointer, wherever that laser is pointed is where it's gonna capture that sound. Um, the DPAs are a 
sister brand of let's say the countryman microphones and we you know you hear them called as the britney spears microphone as well sometimes but these are very direct microphones they're extremely small but they're extremely sensitive so what they can do is they can block out all that outside noise and only really focus on what's being said from the person's mouth um, some of those microphone accessories that i mentioned are windscreen pop filters mic stands boom poles uh, mixers multi-track recorders uh, lavalier clips and a few of those windscreens, as you can see, they come in different flavors from foam windscreens to furries or softies, um, hard blimps to cyclones. So depending on the environment you're in, whether it's high wind or not, you might see on some of the live PGA golf outings, more of the cyclones and the blimps, um, just because they're outdoors and handling that higher winds that could be coming. Pop filters help a lot with the P's and the T's. Um, so to make sure you're not getting those pops into the recording, they help filter all of that out. And they come in different styles from clip-on to screw-on, um, from nylon to mesh. Uh, different types of stands. So tabletop stands, of course, if you were going to be doing like a panel discussion, that's going to be your easiest way to do that versus um, standing stands. So that could be for instrumentals or musicians. Um, and then again, those boom poles, which usually require an audio operator to hold the microphone up above the talent to capture that sound. So you'll see a lot of that in um, you know, remote productions. You'll see a lot of it on some movie productions to where they have one individual who's really in charge of making sure that audio is um, right above the person when they're speaking. And it's a good way to capture many people at once. You don't have to put a microphone on um, 15 people, but you can just move the boom between them as they talk. Um, some of those accessories for field mixers um, are a way to kind of mix the volume between people. So if I were talking or if Adam was talking, um, we can have two inputs that come in and we could, of course, change the level on each of those to make us louder or softer. But overall, your main goal is to mix both of them together so that um, everything sounds equal. Now, for about the same price, maybe a few dollars more, you can get a mixer and a recorder. So this is really helpful um, in the sense that Instead of having just a track that is your final product and that is what it is, these individual recorders can record each person individually. So every input that you put in, it records a separate track on just like a SD card, um, as well as that master mix. So if you were looking to do a little bit more professional recording or editing after you are done with your project, you would have not just the master mix, but you could increase everyone's individual levels as need be post. And of course, clips. So the lavaliers being very um, handy in the industry for that quick and easy style uh, that we discussed. You'll see single and doubles, and sometimes you'll see three, four, and five. So all that really means is it's additional redundancy. So instead of just having one clip and one microphone, um, we've done some larger events where we have somebody who has three or four. So that way, if the microphone went bad, you're you're not out of luck. You have another one as a backup. Um, or if you have multiple people who want to record the same thing but don't want to go off of a what we call a malt box, um, there's usually options to put multiple microphones on there. Kind of like when you see a press conference and there's 15 handhelds. Well, the reason behind that is either comfort level or um, you know everybody wants to get as clean of a audio as they can. So, like I said, I flew through this and I'm actually kind of happy I did because it leaves a lot of time for questions. Um, but the next presentation, I believe, is March 18th. And Adam can speak a little bit more about that. And in that lighting and audio, we will talk more about the different types of lights, uh, when to use them, as well as like a deeper dive into understanding microphones from pickup patterns and actual studio style mixers to give you that more detailed approach about, all right, I have the basic understanding. Where do I go next? Uh, and I kind of just leave it at questions. So Adam, tell me if I went too fast or too slow, but. Oh, that was great. I mean, also it's worth noting that we're recording this program and we'll be sending it out via email afterwards. So if there's anything you want to revisit, you can, you know, once we send that link out, you'll have the link. Also it'll live on the page where you registered too. So if you click the, instead of the register button, it'll be watch the program. So um, look out for that too. Um, a few questions quickly in our last, you know, four minutes. Also thanks, sure. um, Brian, this is super extensive. I learned a lot. Um, uh, do you have any any affordable lighting equipment recommendations? And maybe this is just better answered as tune into the one on March 18th, but is, are there any that come to mind? Yeah, so in today's day and age, you're gonna see a lot more ring lights. Um, what, what that really is, is it's a light that a lot of social media um, YouTubers um, are using to kind of give a not cheap look, but it gives you kind of that ring in the eye, but also gives a full light to you. Um, you can get those anywhere from 
probably 50 to $100 and you can get them from online websites that we can send out afterwards as well. Sounds great. Also, um, could you touch on techniques for lighting when subjects have um, contrasting skin tones and lighting for dark skin tones generally? Sure. Um, but the biggest thing is when you're, when you're looking at lighting, um, of course, you're going to want to look at your background and your subject matter. But when you're looking at the overall scheme of light from white to black, having those two colors together in the same are always really difficult. Um, so if you're going to have white furniture and full black suit, um, even if you're looking at complexion in that same manner, you want to be able to light it in a sense to where you're focusing the light on the areas that need it. We'll dive into that a little bit more on the next presentation, but instead of lighting the entire subject, maybe you um, what we call barn off or you remove light from the lower half. So instead of a chair getting blown out or a background getting blown out, it's really focusing light on the subject matter that you're trying to aim for. Awesome. What's a good mic you um, recommend for putting on virtual concerts? That is a great question. So we, we've done some work with a few organizations now in this COVID environment to where they are wanting to do virtual recordings. Um, the biggest, I guess, question there is always how much would you like to spend, right? So to get a professional grade microphone that just plugs into your laptop, um, it might cost you $50. It's not terribly expensive, um, but, but there's some that are called like snowball mics. So if you were to go on to Google and search snowball microphone, um, it almost looks like a little globe that's on a stand, but it's also USB and can plug into your computer. Um, those snowball mics have a lot of filtering to them and they're somewhat inexpensive to where you, you can use them at home and at high production value. Um, is there a particular um, audio editing software that you would recommend? Well, we're in Adobe House. Uh, I know Adobe might not be the most cost effective depending where you are at. Um, I know they offer some discounts for different organizations and different uses. So it might be a good thing to reach out to one of their sales reps to see what they do. But we, we do a lot of recordings, um, even through Pro Tools. And you can do a single track all the way up to doing 15 to 20 instruments. Um, we've also, for people at home, we've had them using Zoom. We've had them using a program called StreamYard. Anything that you can reach out and find that is a higher quality recording is going to be your best bet to do that. Um, two more quick questions. How, um, any um, tidbits on how to set up or capture an arts technique demonstration? I'm thinking like something from above, or do you ever, you know, deal with kind of like filming from above? Sure. Um, I don't want to search too much on my computer, but I do have some really cool photos. So um, we just did a event for a Kevin Song uh, organization to where they brought in all these trees. And what we had to do was create an artistic approach to how to light these to make them not just look like trees. Uh, what, what I would say is you, you're going to steer more towards harsh lighting. So I'll take away the softness that we talked about and the backlighting but really focusing a hard light on those subjects and kind of making them disappear from the background. So that can be done with having um, anything from black construction paper to black cardboard that's dull, um, not reflective. If it's reflective, it's gonna bounce the light back, but something that's dull that then once the light is shined on the primary subject matter, that's gonna be the primary focus. So either lighting from directly above or directly behind, depending where you want those shadows to be played. And then the last question is, um, seems to be pretty specific about um, uh, just other versions of this presentation you have. So I'm wondering, Brian, if I could drop your contact information in the chat um, for yeah, any no. follow up questions. Feel free to uh, drop in my email or my, my phone number. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. Um, we do a lot of work with a lot of different organizations and happy to help in any way that I can. Um, so yes, feel free. Great, I just um, dropped Brian's email in the chat and just wanted to thank Brian for his time and expertise and also for being a great partner to arts organizations in our region. I know that Detroit Public Television has been doing a lot to um, showcase all the wonderful artistry that's happening around here. And so just wanted to give a huge shout out to Brian um, for making it happen, making the television magic appear and also for um, joining us for this session. We'll be doing a follow-up hack session with Brian on March 18th following um, a future digital access for the arts program. So be sure to join that for a deeper dive into lighting and audio. Um, and the next um, digital access for the arts program will be on February 25th. So join us for that. It'll be all about digital archiving and then we'll follow that with a hack session too. Um, thanks so much again, Brian, for cranking it out and um, good luck at your dentist appointment. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks everyone. Take care everybody.